Well, something happened today in North Texas that hasn't happened since 1878. We have not been in the path of totality. We all know what that word means now of an eclipse in over 100 years. What would that be like? 140-something years, 145, 146 years? It's not going to happen again in North Texas until 2317. And when I say North Texas, I mean kind of specifically where I'm sitting now. If you go about an hour and a half either direction, the numbers get a lot longer. Um, like where I'm from in Tyler, there's not going to be an, we were barely in the path of totality just for like two minutes where it was four minutes here in Dallas. And they're not going to get it again until after the year 3000. So that's how rare of an event it can be. Well, now is the part when we see if things get interesting because we all saw the eclipse. We uh, A bunch of people got in their cars and they hit the roads. Tila Grant from the Texas Department of Transportation is joining the James Show. What are we expecting the roads to look like about right now, Tila? And thanks for being on the show. Just what what's on your mind for uh, the roads? Yeah, thanks for inviting me on, for sure. We are expecting to see some heavy traffic now that we've all seen the eclipse. A lot of people are getting in their cars and they're heading home or heading to their next destination. So we are expecting traffic to get pretty heavy this afternoon. So we're just warning people, like, as you wrap up with your clip stuff, maybe you want to hang around a little bit. There have been a lot of uh, viewing parties and different little events going on. So maybe you should stay at that place a little bit longer. That way you can wait out some of the traffic and we can have a few less cars on the road, you know. Well, I'm sure TxDOT has seen what happened at previous eclipses there was the one in 2017 what did y'all learn from studying what happened at those other eclipse events yeah so we um, made sure to have extra signage so we have like signage everywhere about parking on the sides of roads and just keeping it moving and telling them not to you know wear their glasses as they're driving we have crews out um all in our all of our area offices on standby ready to help um, direct traffic if need be so we do have a lot of people um, out on standby, a lot of our crews, and they'll be doing that through the remainder of the day through tomorrow as well. You know, I was trying to think of comparison. Like, do y'all have a go-to plan that is similar to this? And I, I would think probably Fourth of July, where everyone goes and watches a fireworks show and then clogs the roads. But is there any other comparison or similar event that y'all could sort of co-op the plan for an eclipse? Um, not really. This is this is pretty big for us. You know, this doesn't happen all the time. So yeah, this is a specific plan we we had to put together in just in case for this. Um, so it, it wouldn't, we don't really have anything to compare. We take all of these situations on case by case basis. Yeah. I was thinking like maybe the Super Bowl, but after you watch the Super Bowl, everybody, everybody doesn't get in their car and leave like they may be doing right now for the yeah. eclipse. So you guys are, uh, you're, you're in special territory here. The other thing I heard from another state agency is ERCOT was having to make some adjustments because for about four minutes, there was going to be a few solar plants that were going to not produce. And so that, how do you fill in that gap or what are the problems going to be? Did y'all have any sort of infrastructure issues with the lack of sun for a minute? We I did not know. Yeah. Well, I saw the streetlights come on here in Dallas. What, what was happening around the state? Was that, is that happening everywhere in the state or was that just specific to city? Um, I have to check into that. No one has uh, reported that to me just yet. So I'm not familiar with that. Yeah, that'd be interesting to see if because if you were out in the middle of the the freeway or in the middle of nowhere and it gets dark and there's no streetlights for a second there, you have an unnatural amount of dark that you don't have even during a normal night. Yeah, and some people slow down and wait. And so, yeah, that's also going to contribute to some of this congestion that we're about to see here. Yes. Well, the the people that came in town, are are y'all expecting them to stay another night or is everyone going home today? Uh, we expect a lot to go home, but we we do expect traffic to be heavy for quite some time. And like I said, we will have our crews staying out there on standby um, for the remainder of today and tomorrow. Where were you during the eclipse, Tila? Were you in some sort of like Star Trek looking bridge with a bunch of monitors or did you get to go outside and look up for a few minutes? Yeah, I actually got to hang out with uh, my um, folks out here in Garland. Um, they had a viewing party, and I was actually able to kind of pop in on that. And uh, we actually did a live. So if you always want to check out our Instagram page, I actually shot some video for a live shot of the event. Um, and then we have crews all over town in our Dallas district, um, some of our other PIOs um, taking video and getting pictures and stuff, too. And so, yeah, we, we've got all the angles of it covered for sure. That, that's fun. Where can we find that? <laughs> on our Instagram page is Dallas Instagram page. And that's where the live. Will be. All right. Well, Tila Grant, thanks for sharing a fun day with us. This is for, uh, Tila Grant from the Department of Transportation. Thank you, Tila. Yep. All right. Uh, how was your eclipse day? Did you have a good party outside? I think most of the people listening now did what I did. And you're at work 
and you got your glasses and you snuck out when it happened and then you had to sneak back in and, and do some work. And then there were some people like here, like poor Sean stuck on the board. Uh, Sean, the, the Dan Bongino's best friend. He couldn't leave, so he didn't really get to see it except looking out the window. And then I have a friend who just didn't care. My friend Chris is like, yeah, what? It's going to be dark for like four minutes. Whatever. I'm not going to leave work. I'm going to do my same normal thing. I'm not even, I mean, I might, if I'm outside already, I might look up or something. But what? Just didn't care. We are next to the American Airlines Center downtown Dallas, and there's a plaza right outside our front door where a bunch of people have gathered, and they're all, they've got their cameras, they've got their phones, they've got the glasses, they're looking up. And it, it it was cool because it did not look like a normal day. It was cool because there were people that were lined all up and down the sidewalks here uh, where we're at in downtown. It's a nice little park area. You know, it's Victory Park, Victory Plaza, all that good stuff. There are a bunch of people with cameras set up and the people with tripods with cameras. And, you know, the, the camera people are serious. When you get to the tripod level, that is the, the, a level of serious that most of us never contend with. But then it was beyond that. It was on the tripod sticking up, and it had the lenses on it uh, that, that looked like a car muffler, like the muffler off of Ford F-150, you know, those big, giant lenses. So there were some people doing some serious photography here, which kind of blows my mind. Isn't there a whole lot of light pollution in downtown Dallas? Because all the lights did come on. It was cool. The street lights came on. The, the billboards around here were all blown up, uh, and they automatically get brighter. It was um, it was amazing, but the interesting eclipse stories are not what happened today. There's two eclipse stories from history I want to share with you. The the one that you're sort of familiar with is the Christopher Columbus one, where he wasn't getting along too well with the Indians, so he said, "If you don't be nicer, I'm going to blot out the moon." It kind of went like that, except there's there's more to it, and I, I can share it to you here in about two minutes. So Christopher Columbus is on, not his first voyage, but, but one of the subsequent voyages. And th- there are worms. There are marine worms that were eating through the hull of one of his ships. So some people are going to have to stay behind. Well, Christopher Columbus, being the leading by example type of guy he is, says, well, I'll take a crew and I'll stay here. Y'all go get help. Come back and pick me up next year. Okay, that was the plan. So they got dropped off on an island we now know as... Jamaica, yes. This was a little bit before Bob Marley got there. The Arawak Indians were freaked out because they'd never seen big boats before. They had never seen white people before. They had never seen people wearing metal like that. They had never seen the clothing, the armor. They hadn't seen a whole. So they were wowed at first. Oh, my goodness, you must be messengers from God or something. And there, there was the complete inability to talk for months. But after about six months after Christopher Columbus had been there a while, they had developed the ability to talk. And things were going good at first. They were supplying all his buddies with food. And after about six months or so, the interest in their hospitality had begun to wane. And Christopher said, we are not raiding these people. We are not pulling out our swords and guns. And we are not killing people and taking their food. We're not stealing their livestock. We're not stealing their crops. Well, a few more days of being hungry and half the crew mutinied. They went on a raid just like Vikings would. Went through, killed some people, stole a bunch of food, tore some stuff up. And so now the Arawaks completely cut them off, and Christopher Columbus came up with the idea about the eclipse. So he shows up at night, and he tells the chief, hey, man, you're going to have to start giving us food again. This whole thing where you cut us off, God's mad. He's, he's like, super mad, like, going to blot out the moon mad. And the Indians had the reaction you and I would have. -uh. -uh." Nuh-uh. And I I don't know what it was in ancient Arawak, but it translates now to, nuh-uh. So Christopher Columbus says he's going to go talk to his God, and he goes into one tent by himself. And uh, he finds out, like, okay, what's the perfect time I need to come out? All right, now I need to go out. So he goes out. He says, all right, yeah, I talked to God. He's, he's, he's going he's gonna to blot out the moon. And then almost right then, the moon started being blotted out. So then Christopher Columbus says, well, there's nothing you can do about it now. You already ticked him off. And they're like, well, please, please, please. Can you reason with your God? Can, can, can you change his mind? He's like, well, I can try. So he goes back in the tent, and he has an hourglass. He flips over the hourglass. And according to the almanac that was on his boat, you're like, what? how did he know about the eclipse? He's a sailor. They, they navigated by the stars. They didn't have Garmin yet. They didn't have any GPS. They didn't have radar. They didn't have nothing. So they're, they're very into stars, all these sailors. So according to the almanac, this is going to last about, oh, 48 minutes. So he turns over the hourglass, and when about 45 minutes is up, he goes out and starts having the conversation with him again. And he's, look, God said if you're going to start uh, supplying us with food again, and I, I don't know, maybe uh, maybe some wives, you know, because we're getting kind of lonely over there in our uh, camp. 
uh, maybe we can work something out. And they're like, fine, fine, whatever. I didn't know we ticked off God so bad. And then it goes exactly how you think. There was no shortage of food. Christopher Columbus gets picked up in June. This happened on Leap Day. Leap Day, 1504. And he didn't get picked up again until June. So he stayed for a whole year in Jamaica before they had resorts. The other really cool one is a, a story you know nothing about. It's uh, something I came across. I went through a Persian history phase for a second there, Darius and Cyrus and all that. And one of the crazy stories from that part of the world, this happened in 585 B.C. This is during Old Testament times. In fact, this is rolled up way up in the Old Testament. This this is before the Persians freed the, the Jews from the Babylonians, the Israelites from the Babylonians. This is 585 B.C. I'm going to let History Pod do a summary. I, I got this edited down to 90 seconds, about as tight as I can get it for you. Here it goes. On the 28th of May, 585 BCE, a solar eclipse during the Battle of Halis led to a truce between the kingdoms of Media and Lydia, making it the earliest historical event that can be precisely dated. Having fought a series of indecisive battles in the preceding years, the two armies met again in 585 BCE, during which a solar eclipse took place. It's described how suddenly the day became night, and that the warring armies interpreted this as an omen to stop fighting. The peace was sealed by Aliati's daughter marrying one of Syaxes' surviving sons. Later astronomers were able to pinpoint the exact date of historical eclipses using the same calculations that helped to predict future ones. By combining data of these ancient events with contextual knowledge of the Battle of Halis, the 28th of May 585 BCE was consequently identified as the most likely date. This makes the day of the battle a cardinal date, meaning that it provides a waypoint from which numerous other dates in the ancient world can be calculated. So that battle is the oldest historical event we know the exact day of. Because they didn't use B.C. and, and A.D. before Jesus was even born. My goodness, how would they even know? that Before who? Before some guy hadn't been born yet. So they would say, like, in the 12th reign of Nebuchadnezzar or in the 8th reign of I don't know, Ataxerxes or something. And, and so you don't have the, the a date that's concretely tethered to a, a specific time. It, it's all subjective, except for this one. This is the oldest one. And I find that to be a very believable story because in ancient battles, you know, ancient warfare, that sounds horrible. I mean, you're some dude out there and you're in the Anatolian Plateau, that, what's Turkey now. It's super hot. It's summer. It's like Memorial Day weekend. You're carrying all kinds of armor on you and it's metal. So metal sitting out in the sun gets hot as hell and you have to have it all padded so it doesn't burn you. So you're like super clothed up. You're carrying this heavy sword or spear and even heavier shield. And all of a sudden, it starts to get a little cloudy outside, and then a, a little shadowy, and a little orange, like you just saw about 30 minutes ago. And they're like, well, I guess that means we shouldn't fight anymore. And of course, that's what the guy on the front lines were saying. That's what I would say if I was on the front lines holding a big, dumb spear and a heavy shield in the middle of the sun, about to uh, be overrun by someone in a chariot. No, nope, no, nope, I got, you know what, they, that you don't want to ignore the gods. Looks like the gods, yeah, that's, uh, that looks like they want us to stop fighting. Guess they want peace. Hey. Hey, listen, I'm not a mind reader. I mean, you're going to argue with God. I'm not blotting out the sun. God is. So, yeah, those are the two great eclipse stories from history. I, I love both of those. I mean, the, the Columbus one, that sounds like a, sort of a catch-me-if-you-can movie. That didn't even sound real. Oh, I'm going to blot out the sun. And one of the coolest places to be for today's eclipse was at the Perot Museum here in downtown Dallas. Clayton Neville from our sister station, he does the morning show over at KLIF, was at the Perot Museum during the eclipse. And what was going on there? Uh, paint the picture. Welcome to the James Show, by the way. But what was going on at the Perot Museum for the eclipse? I was channeling my inner nerd there and not expecting it because I became emotional like a lot of people when it went dark when you started to see that ring of fire and you realized, oh my gosh, this is going to stick around for a few minutes. I looked around and saw, in fact, at one point I saw a mom, a dad, and I probably like a 10 year old kid all looking up at the same time, all three just holding each other. And they hold, they held each other for like all three minutes. And you looked around and what had been a really loud party was just a lot of people having intimate moments among each other, just staring up and looking. And I saw, I would say dozens of people with each 
surprised. I saw one guy just bawling in the corner. It was really interesting to see the emotional aspect. At first, it was very festive, and afterwards, it was festive. But in the moment, people were emotional. It was pretty neat to see. So at the Pro Museum, didn't they have, like, astronauts or some incredible people there? Who, who were, like, the guests that have speakers or something? Yeah, they had a bunch of speakers, which was cool. It was Carnegie that was there. And the reason why it was so cool is because they were actually kind of on the mic walking us through, you know, what you were seeing and things like that. So that allowed people to really be educated. And they had 7,000 people there. It was a sold-out event. They sold 7,000 tickets. It was completely packed in that outside parking lot. People could go into the museum, too, before and after. But, yeah, it was pretty amazing to see. And that was one of the things that a lot of people told me afterwards was it was, you know, once in a lifetime for a lot of people, the event itself. But watching it with a lot of other people made it more special. See, I, I really appreciate this event because we get a whole lot of the the segment of society that eats Tide Pods or watches The Real Housewives of whatever. And if you do those things, whatever. But this is all of society focused on something that's educational and halfway intelligent. And I thought that was a, a nice change of pace. Yeah, I saw a Congo line with the sun and the moon. That was pretty interesting out there with a live band. Hadn't seen that before. Uh, but they were literally dressed up as the sun and the moon mascot. People were embracing this thing. And the other cool part it was, there were places like Cleveland and some spots in New York that were embracing it. But Al Roker was there. You know, NBC and other national outlets were there at the Perot. That's as well. so right. I mean, Al Roker was in Dallas. Yeah. Cool. It was on full display, which was neat. Yeah. All right, are you still there, or did you leave? Because if you left, I would like a traffic report. Yeah, I left, and I'm actually home, so I can give you a good traffic report. Um, and, you know, I was down at the Pro, which is down there by the station. And instead of taking 75 and Woodall Rogers, because a lot of that was closed during the eclipse, I took the tollway, cruised all the way, tollway to 635, with no delays at all, and I'm back in Richardson now. So it was pretty smooth sailing. Well, that's fantastic. All right, well, thank you very much, Clay Devil. You can hear him on our sister station, KLI, uh, for the morning show. Thanks for the report, Clayton. Yep, thanks. All right, look, and this is another cool caller, too. I want to do this one first. Ashley and Tyler, you're on the James Show, 820 AM, now 93.3 FM WBAP. How was your Eclipse experience? Hi, it was amazing, and uh, I actually wasn't in Tyler. I was in DFW because I came uh, from the airport from Denver, and that entire plane, I want to say maybe 10 of the people were there just to get back from De- uh, to, to Dallas, but that entire plane was there for the eclipse. And it was crazy. And I'm just like, I'm trying to go home. <laughs> yeah, so I'd heard about this. People were spending a whole bunch of money so they could be on an airplane specifically for the eclipse. You just happened on it. Did you have a window seat on the good side? I did have a window seat, um, but the we actually landed right before the eclipse. So I was actually able to go somewhere and get some glasses and park in a grocery grocery uh, parking lot and just watch it with my dog. It was It was amazing. And just like the caller before me, it was really emotional i people were whooping and hollering around me i started howling <laughs> okay and it was it was amazing um but yeah total 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 one life time opportunity i myself before was just like eh, whatever you know there'll be other eclipses but once i finally was there and had the opportunity to see it it was it was amazing well, I appreciate your excitement. Thanks for sharing your story, Ashley and Tyler. Let's go to Dane in Emory. You're on 820 AM, now 93.3 FM WBAP. Good afternoon, James. How are you doing today? I am well, Dane. How was your eclipse watching experience? Well, I was I was in my apartment complex here in Emory, and uh, it got so dark that the lights came on. The people had like those outdoor sensor lights. Yeah, 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 the, 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 the light was, sensors. And it was so dark, even part of the streetlights came on. Yeah, we had something similar to that here in downtown Dallas. I got to walk outside of, of the station and next to the American Airlines Center and stuff where we are. All The streetlights came on. The streetlights must be on a light sensor as well. They popped on for about four minutes, and when the the, uh, the sun came back out, they went back off. And yeah, it, It's kind of cool to see how much of that stuff is automated. And you can also imagine that for a weird few minutes there, the Texas power grid had to power all these lights in the middle of the afternoon. At the same time, solar panels stopped producing, and so I was... I was just wondering about what well, there must well, be some nice crazy live in a small town too. So oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So, well, see, my my family's out in the small town, and they got to watch a little bit from the their backyard. Well, we're probably not too far from each other. I live in Emory. Yeah, yeah, you're not. I I live just south of Tyler, between Flint and Bullard. I know where you're. I know exactly where that's at. Yeah, yeah. middle of nowhere. Sir. All right, let's exactly, go. Exactly. But you have a good rest of your afternoon, and first time I ever talked. 
called into your uh, program. Well, glad to have you, Dane and Emery. Let's go to Carl and Burleson. You're on the James Show. What was your Eclipse experience like? It was pretty close to a religious thing for me. Uh, in my, I've been on this earth for 69 years. I remember the eclipse that we had back in 2017, in which I was watching with uh, using the two piece of paper pinhole camera type thing to watch it. This time I had the glasses. We were prepared. It started about an hour before, and right when uh, the the time that they gave us on the TV stations and all, it was right on the money, right at 1.40. Uh, the, we got totality, and uh, we took our glasses off, and we were looking at the corona. We were really, really blessed and got a good break in the clouds where nothing, uh, the full time, we had clear skies. To see it, it was absolutely beautiful. Never experienced that in my lifetime. I'm interested in your wording. You used the term religious experience. Now, I can't say it was a religious experience for me, but I've heard already a dozen people say that, whether it's on TV or Clayton talked about seeing people at the Perot Museum. I saw people in the plaza in front of our office. But throughout history, people have seen this as a religion, ex- religious experience. You know, I told the story about there was a battle going on in ancient times that stopped because of the eclipse. They all put their swords down and decided, I guess we got to have peace. You know, so clearly thousands of people saw that as a religious experience. So you're not alone in that. With Carl and Burleson, thanks for calling in on the James Show. Let's go to William. William and Garland, you're on 820 AM now, 93.3 FM WBAP. Yeah, so we had a telescope that had a filter on it. We had binoculars that had that were specifically made for this, and we had our glasses. And I got to say, it was something really spectacular. And be able to even photograph Venus and Jupiter, I... I I don't know how to describe it. It was just Oh, awesome. look at William. He has out nerded us all. Not only were you aware well, of the planets being visible during the middle of the day, you had the technology to film it, to, to photo it? Uh well, uh I I learned that you can if your your camera lens on your phone is small enough that that you could actually use your uh glasses. So I put my eyes right up to my screen so I could watch where the uh eclipse was as it was going out and the clear the clouds cleared up just before the totality and i haven't seen the clouds come back since wasn't that perfect was it because the uh, this whole morning like i'm driving into work just looking up like the one of the final scene of goodfellas when he, the helicopter's following him i'm just looking up at the clouds being is there a break anywhere it's just one big solid cloud it's like a whole blanket's over the whole sky and then right before it happened I, I hadn't been outside in a while but i go outside and i see it breaking up seriously like eight minutes before when when the when the eclipse started because the it started being covered like about one o'clock about 40 minutes before totality it was still cloudy here it was still cloudy when when coverage was starting here so yeah close to a miracle for us but uh, you know what congratulations on getting some photos and being super prepared and and getting the most out of it i hadn't heard anyone else brag about seeing the planets yet so you win uh william you win the smarty pants award on the james show today uh give him five points sean we're keeping points page in clarksville you're on the james show how was your eclipse experience page oh my gosh it was fabulous i was east of clarksville Um, in a clearing in the middle of a pine tree farm, only with my glasses and my dog, the vultures that had been picking apart um, an armadillo in the road nested, the birds stopped, the owls started back just at the very end of the eclipse. But let me tell you that the highlight was at the very, very end of totality when the sun started peeking back out just looked like a spotlight from heaven. It was magnificent. Yeah, it was. so they called that the diamond ring. Some Someone said that on, uh, I think, uh, on the WBAP morning show, one of the guests called it the diamond ring effect because you can see the corona, which makes a ring, and then once the sun starts po- poking out or the last second before the sun gets covered, there's just one giant ball of brilliance on one end of yeah. it. Yeah, and it kind of looked like an engagement ring, which I thought was great. But I'm glad you called in because Clarksville, I know where that's at. It's halfway between Paris and Texarkana. We didn't get to observe observe the reaction of the animals here in downtown Dallas. We don't have a whole lot. We probably have fewer owls, 
I should say, and there were no vultures yeah. picking apart yeah. roadkill in the middle of, of Victory Plaza. But that's something I had heard about, too, where farmers had reported in previous eclipses that the cows would come back in the barn. And they're like, well, I guess the day's over. You know, they have no idea it's an eclipse. So that that's cool. Thank uh, yeah. you. Thank you for the animal perspective. Anything else you want to add to that? In a, no, thank you for your show. I thoroughly enjoy it. Well, thank you for your story. That was fun. Let's do Nick and McKinney. Nick McKinney, you're on 820 AM now, 93.3 FM WBAP. Hey, I had a great day today. Uh, I'm a middle school music teacher, and we had a big eclipse party. Uh, I played uh, Total Eclipse of the Heart and sang it for about 200 kids. Uh, we did some Pink Floyd, uh, Brain Damage, and Eclipse. And then we did uh, Soundgarden, Black Hole Sun, right as totality was happening. And it was an amazing experience. Was your school out today? Because my kids got out of school the entire day, even though their school in Buck Tussle wasn't in the path of totality. Well, my school was not out today, but we had about maybe three-quarters of the kids present, and about one-fourth of them were out. Um, we didn't really do a whole lot of schoolwork today, uh, believe it or not, but we did uh, have a lot of fun watching the eclipse, and uh, I was really glad that the kids got to, to be there and got to share that experience with us. You know, So even though we had school, which some people were upset about, I think it was a great experience for the kids that were there. No kidding. Well, thanks for making it special for the kids because they're probably never going to see this again, or at least you're not. Me and you, we're, we're, we'll be dead before this happens again. One more. Let's do David and Forney. You're on the James Show on 820 AM, now 93.3 FM WBAP. Well, I'll tell you, I was okay looking at it. It was something, but it didn't get dark as I thought it would. <clears throat> that is my my main question is, has anybody actually gone blind from looking at the like, you know, masses of people like the 17, 1800s? Oh, definitely. And the, 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 the phenomenon that happens when you stare at the sun during an eclipse, or really at any time, but it happens a lot during the eclipse, is that it turns your, your, uh, cornea, your lens into a magnifying glass. So it's just like you burn ants on the sidewalk with a magnifying glass. You're burning some spot in the back of your retina. A lot of times it comes back, but for many people, if you burn it fast enough, hot enough, you will have a spot in the, in your vision for the rest of your life. And people have documented that. People have written in their personal journal, journals or correspondence with other people. You know, when people used to send mail, uh, talking about spots in their eyes from looking at the sun or looking at an eclipse. And it was a big deal with sailors. You know what a sextant is? That's, that's how you find your latitude and longitude using the sun. And anyway, the, the, a lot of sailors would burn their eyes looking at, uh, looking at the sun so they could get the, the proper coordinates on where they were sailing. And so that's why so many of them had eye patches is because they would ruin their eyes looking at the sun for a sextant. We don't know what a sextant is. I only know this from books. I never saw one in, in, with my own eyes. It's just a history thing but yeah you're absolutely right thank you david dale and bell you're on the james show news talk 820 wbap now 933 fm wbap what was your eclipse situation like ah thanks for having me on thanks for calling I'm from gainesville texas area but uh get to see the better eclipse i drove over to a little town called bells texas and pulled into a new gas station and there was a big group of people there and we just set up camp there to watch and uh, it was marvelous marvelous yeah I, 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 I had a, a similar experience here to where we just happened to be at the same little open area of a parking lot or not a parking lot but a plaza at the same time so for a while there there were a handful of strangers that had a little impromptu party in a shared moment yeah yep. some of them there was a group from california some from uh, idaho and and mainly mainly from uh, oklahoma but i have a a, a small pet story about it. Go ahead. I have a 80-pound uh, pet tortoise that I carry with me, travels with me, and uh, he got to experience it all. And to, to make it special, when the blot out came, he actually went up to under a truck and went to sleep for a couple of minutes. All right, that, that's kind of adorable. Uh, I guess you're on the way to race a, a hare or something. Thank you for sharing your story, Dale and Bell. I had to look up Bell. I never heard of that before. Doug in Fort Worth, you're on the James Show, 820 AM, now 93.3 FM WBAP. What's your Eclipse story, Doug? Well, I thank you uh, for talking to me. Uh, I guarantee you that you know, the anticipation and everything that was going into it was a great thing, and I enjoyed it. It was a beautiful experience. By kind of equate to having sex, you know, you get a lot of anticipation. You got a lot of forethought to what's going on it. And four and a half minutes later, it's over. 
And after that, you enjoy the afterglow. I can't say you're wrong. Say you may be a little inappropriate. Four and a half minutes might be a little long in my book, but I appreciate you calling in, sir. I'm not I'm not an Olympic athlete. Don't look at me like that. All right, uh, I can squeeze in another call. Let's do Bob. Bob on I-20. You're on the James Show, 820 AM, now 93.3 FM WBAP. What was your Eclipse experience, sir? Hey, it, it was fantastic. It was, uh, I, first of all, I'm on my way from Connecticut to uh, eventually Pasadena. I'm going to Las Vegas first for the NAB. And I have never saw seen the Eclipse total before ever. And it was on a bucket list. And I thought, okay, well, I could probably plan this out. Texas is most likely to be clear. And then two days ago, I'm looking at the forecast thinking, oh, no, this is going to be a problem. But the feeling of it actually coming on and and watching the stars start to come out. And I was fortunate to have some uh, people that joined me in the area. I was in a, a little complex of houses being built, so I wanted a nice open area. And to watch it get dark in a matter of probably 10 seconds was the weirdest thing I've ever felt. And all the crickets started coming out and making their noise, doing their things. Um, the birds, of course, did their thing, you know, going back to the nest. And uh, I, I got goosebumps, and I was fortunate enough to get a pair of glasses from uh, the ladies that were there because I didn't have any. Um, and I was able to take some photos with my phone using the glasses. And then, of course, during the uh, total eclipse, I was able to take it direct, too, and actually see the, the, the planets that were up there. Yeah, absolutely amazing. Bob, it and, sounds and like you're – hang on, hang on. It sounds like you're being yeah. wildly irresponsible because I remember the authorities telling us over and over, do not just pull over on the side of the road to see it. If you're going to get uh, wherever you're going to get to, don't just like at the last minute pull over and, and, and try and watch it, and you did it anyway. And But there was no problem, no, no. right? No, no. I went to a to, – it, it was a dead-end road with a nice – open fields oh there was there was no traffic it was a it was where they're building houses so oh no I- hey, even even if it was in, oh, in in the middle of traffic i don't care if if you stopped yeah. and pulled over on the side of the road for four minutes it's not that yeah. big of a deal text dot yeah all yeah, right there's no, and there's no problem leaving i'm at uh, exit 370 headed west and uh there was no problem leaving town so traffic is moving along nicely and uh, you guys do a great job and i'll carry your signal probably for another hundred miles or so great well look that's fantastic that we're not having traffic issues because i think that was the only thing people were really worried about is is traffic being in a gridlock and hey say hi to a bunch of my friends at the nab i go to that sometimes i'm just definitely not going this year oh that's too bad otherwise we'd love to see you do i know you i'm bob gilmore do you know bob gilmore i don't know Ah, that sounds familiar all right thanks bob yeah gary and ferris you're on the james show how was your eclipse experience it was pretty good. If you didn't get the glasses early, you probably didn't get the glasses. So uh, I didn't get the glasses. So I used my cell phone, and uh, I tested it uh, early to make sure I wasn't going to burn it out. And uh, basically, it was even total eclipse. It was too bright to get a good contrast. So uh, I put uh, I put my sunglasses over the lens and got a decent picture. And I caught a. I caught a glimpse, you know, you know, no more than you would normally do on a sunny day when you're looking up usually. So I got pretty good pictures and, uh, I, uh, sent one to my daughter who moved out of the Metroplex, uh, a year or so ago. So she appreciated it. So do you live in Ferris or did you go out to Ferris for the eclipse? Oh, I live there. At, you know, All I, right. guess I'm, I guess I'm a habit today. They brought the eclipse to me. Right. Uh, well, fun stuff. Thanks for sharing your makeshift photography experience for the eclipse, Gary. Let's go to Jana. Jana in East Dallas, you're on the James Show, News Talk 820 WBAP, now on FM at 93.3. How was your eclipse experience? Hey, it hey. was great. We went. I live, from, I live in East Dallas, and I went to White Rock Lake. And, you know, we got there early, and everyone was gathering. It was just so beautiful. And the minute the totality happened... Everybody started cheering and hugging each other and just, it was just a beautiful moment in this really um, hard world right now. Um, I just wish we could have that all the time, but it was a beautiful moment here in East Dallas. Well, what was White Rock Lake right? Because there's been, what was it like? Because there's been some controversy there. There was like a sewage spill or whatever, and I heard they were going to change the name to Brown Rock Lake. Is that a... (laughs) 
You know, I think that's like happened before, but you know, us East Dallas people, that is our core. Um, I went to Woodrow Wilson High School in East Dallas and that's where, and tell my age, I graduated in 1978 and we used to go to Wild Rock Lake. It was called Woodrow Hill at that time. So we've always, it's just been a precious part of our community for many, many years. And yeah, I think that probably happened, but we don't think about that. <laughs> Fun stuff. All right. Thank you for sharing the the view from White Rock Lake for the eclipse, Janet. Let's go to Norman. Norman in Lake Dallas. You're on 820 AM, now 93.3 FM, WBAP. Thank you so much for taking my call. We just had such an enlightening experience at Louisville Lake and Willow Grove Park in Lake Dallas. It was totally awesome, man. It's on my bucket list, and I'll never see another one. I'm 66. Our son had his 26-year birthday out there. Today's his birthday. James, it was just unbelievable. I loved it, and we got the diamonds, and I got inspired. And those were not stars. Those were two planets, one to the right, one to the left. It was just unbelievable. I loved it, and thank you for taking my call, and God bless. I love WBAP. Well, we love you, too. Thank you very much, Norman. So the most consequential eclipse as far as science happened in 1919. It's it's super famous. It came up in a couple of my college classes, but then I most recently read about it in Evan Sayet's new book because one of the things that was hanging on this was called the Eddington Experiment was Einstein's theory of relativity. It was still kind of new, and a, a, a lot of the scientific community was doubting it because if light could be bent by gravity, that means light could be stopped by gravity that means actually it puts a start date on the universe in the whole the debate that happened before this eclipse in 1919 scientists weren't sure if the universe had already been here or if the universe had a start date now for the theory of relativity to be true that would make the big bang have to be the origin of the universe which means there is an origin at some point if we're an expanding universe go backwards it went down to a singularity So if light could be bent, if you could measure the light as it went from a star to next to the sun and see if the sun had the gravity enough to bend it, then that would mean Einstein is correct. And the entirety of the previous scientific community was wrong. The the universe is not immortal. But you can only do this during an eclipse because the rest of the light is washed out while the sun's on. And so when that eclipse happened they were ready for it they had sent teams down to like an island off the coast of africa or whatever to get the most accurate reading or whatever turns out einstein was right the air quotes establishment scientists the atheist community was wrong and science was changed forever and that was only a hundred years ago that was 105 years ago it's it's a great uh wiki hole to go down to the eddington experiment in the 1919 eclipse i'm gonna squeeze in one more call here Mary Ann Burleson, you're on the James Show. How was your eclipse experience? It was great. There were seven of us there. And, of course, we had to have an eclipse party. And the centerpiece, and you'll have to imagine, is 12 Oreo cookies. And the top one is solid. And the one at 1 o'clock is a little bit of the white showing. At 2 o'clock, a little more. 3 o'clock, more. 4 o'clock, more. And then at 6 o'clock, a total white Oreo. And then you go back up to 12, and it comes from the other direction and hides the sun. Oh, that's so adorable. At the grocery store, I saw yellow cupcakes with an Oreo on top of them yesterday. They were Eclipse cupcakes. I thought that was just cute. That, it was clever. And then, of course, we had to have pizza. Every party has to have pizza. But also, they do. since we were told as children that the che- uh, moon was made of cheese, we had cheese. And then since it was a solar eclipse, we had sun chips. And then since it was the solar eclipse where the moon was involved for dessert, we had moon pies. Oh, aren't y'all just full of puns today? (laughs) What's the matter? Were y'all out of Sunny D? Did you not have a sun-kissed? Fun stuff. Thank you for sharing, Marianne. Sounds like y'all had a lot of fun with the eclipse. You did. You did. Thanks. All right. And and thank you, everyone, for for sharing your eclipse stories. I'll get back to those. Uh, We're going to do Dead or Alive next. I got to try and give away these tickets. In fact, we're going to give them away. Someone's getting fluffy tickets here in about 10 minutes. And then we'll get back to your eclipse stories. This is fun stuff. Uh, so 800-288-WBAP, 800-288-9227. Share your experience with history. Coming up next on The James Show, News Talk 820 WBAP, now on FM at 93.3. But first, Bob Lavelle, Home Marketing Services. Where were you for the eclipse? How was your eclipse experience, Bob? My eclipse was excellent. I was uh, in the office working. I saw the massive 
crowds getting out, and I thought they were all leaving the United States and heading back to Mexico. Uh, I, I thought it was no. uh, adorable that for, for some people, they thought, you know, this is the end of the world or the mark of some calamity or whatnot. It's like, well, for most of us, we still have to go to work. Well, that's true. It, nowadays, back in the old days, maybe they would leave. But I was listening to your Einstein theory of relativity, right? Yes. Now, I'm not the brightest puppy in the box, but his relativity theory was also for every action, there's an opposite and equal reaction. That's Newton, but close enough. Okay. Like I said, I wasn't the brightest one in the box. So let's go with Newton. So here's how it works. You pick up the phone, for example, and you call us, and then we schedule an appointment. That's the reaction. Then you come in after we schedule it, and that's your reaction. And in 15 minutes, you find out exactly where you stand on qualifying for your home. And then you get excited, and we get you out on the weekend, and you pick out your dream home, and you get it for maybe in the high fours for an interest rate and all the other goodies that we do, because that is the best opposite and equal reaction I can think of. All right. If you want Bob to make that happen for you, 972-392-9595. It's 972-392-9595. I know buying a house sounds like a lot of work, but you call Bob, you give him a little bit of info, and they do most of the legwork for you. So call 972-392-9595. Thanks, Bob. Thank you, James. Mitch in Hewitt. You're on 820 AM, now 93.3 FM, WBAP. Hey, James. How's it going? It's going uh, well, yeah, Mitch. I just, yeah, I just uh, I, I stayed home from work, just got my glasses out and watched, took some pictures and watched my neighbors, everybody outside. And I mean, it was amazing to watch. I don't think it was a religious experience, but it sure was a scientific experience for me because the, the timing that they had was almost perfect and everything. So it's just like, just amazing to watch. Well, I thought it was uh, interesting when Clayton Neville reported at the Perot Museum, people were crying. People like had tears coming out of their eyes. And look, I I wish something meant as much to me as this eclipse means to some people, but it just doesn't. No, it was it was fun to watch. I took the day off and I don't know if you remember me. I used to listen to you back when he was in Waco. Oh, wow. That's uh, that's a while back. Well, I get, you know, Hewitt, that's that's the same area. Does your yeah. boss know you took off for the eclipse or did you tell him you had the runs or what? No, I just didn't. You know, my my work, I can just kind of like come and go as I please anyway. So I just took the day off. So. Oh, that's nice. Well, th- th- thanks for yeah. reconnecting now that I'm up here in Dallas until. Uh, the- yeah, I, I've been listening to ever since you came back. I, I'm Welcome back to Central Texas. So. Oh, that's awesome. F- fantastic. Thank you very m- much, Mitch. I'm surprised people remember. I really am. It's an honor that people remember any of that stuff because this is just me doing what I want to do, having the job I want to have. And if someone remembers it, that's all bonus after that. Let's go to Kenneth. Hey, Kenneth, you're in Kaufman County on WBAP, now 93.3 WBAP FM. How was your eclipse experience, sir? Same old, same old. I was at work. We stepped out for a few minutes. But my question to you is, is with everybody looking up in the sky all at the same time, do you today do you think maybe bigfoot came out for four minutes dude uh p diddy could have gone to a daycare and and had a good time no no one was paying attention to the outside world and i kind of liked that i kind of liked for a second when i went outside and i and i just went down the street to uh to the corner store that people were stopped they were looking up they had their tripod set up they had their phone out they were with friends or co-workers or whatever and i do kind of like the idea that a lot of people stopped down now you sound like my friend chris who had to work today and didn't take any time off and doesn't care and his attitude this is a quote from chris it's going to be dark for like four minutes so what because that's how he talks he says a real gravelly voice you sound like that kenneth you you don't seem very impressed by the eclipse oh i was but i was just kind of looking up and down because i was really hoping to see bigfoot come out all right well if you saw bigfoot this is the same phone number 800-288-wbap 800-288-wbap i would like to hear your eclipse or bigfoot stories belinda in belton you're on the james show how was your eclipse experience today belinda well it was wonderful my daughter had a party i mean she went all out 
Uh, she made uh, chocolate cupcakes and put yellow icing on it so it would be sun and the moon. Uh, we brought all kinds of food. And about every five minutes, we would go out and look up and just see the progression of the sun co- of the moon coming across the sun. And that was a lot of fun. And then she also had word search, solar word search games and solar bingo where she gave prizes and we had all kinds of food and everything had to be round. And so, uh, but it was just so much fun. And it, I thought it was an awesome experience. I really didn't, I really didn't think it was going to be that awesome, but to see that whole movement taking place and, uh, finally, the whole blackout, and then to be able to see the ring of fire around, it was just, yeah. Well, well the ring of fire was the that. big difference compared to the eclipse that we had in October. Did you see the October eclipse? It was just a partial for all of us, but did you see it? Right. I did. Yeah. And uh, that was that was cool, too, but this was just awesome. Now, why and isn't the party summer, still going? This is something that happened at 140, 150, and it's it's not even 5 o'clock. Y'all already packed it in, or did you pass out, or throw up? What's going on? <laughs> no, we we packed it up, you know, shortly after that, but uh, but to to experience how dark it got at that very moment, when and how the progression of it getting darker, like dusk and all of that, before the the darkness that was cool, but we had three couples who just brought blankets and pillows and just laid out on the grass so they could just look up the whole time, and it was just so much fun. I was too old to do that. They would have had to got a crane to get me up off the ground, but um, anyway. Yeah, so the, the corona was the coolest part because I'd never seen that with my own eyes. It's things I'd only seen on TV or YouTube or something, and I, I was kind of struck by how not uniform It was the little rays that you could see coming off of the corona, the clouds. It wasn't a circle and it wasn't symmetrical. It it had weird streaks in it and parts of it were were longer than the other. And it kind of looked like a mess. I did not expect that, Belinda. Yeah, me either. It was just great. I don't know what it was like in Dallas. Of course, we're in central Texas, south of Waco. And um, at first we were kind of worried about the clouds, but it would the clouds would come across and then they would clear off and then. We'd be able to see each little progression as it took place. So, anyway. yeah, worked out great. Thank you very much, Belinda. Let's go to Shu in Farmer's Market. How was your eclipse experience, Shu? Yeah, Farmer's Branch. Farmer's Branch. I'm sorry. I, I, yeah, I, I, I even read working, it wrong. Yeah, I was working in the garage, and when, about the time it started, I just put on a welding helmet, lit up a cigar, took my cup outside, and I watched it. It was great. How can oh, you yeah, do a welding was, helmet and a cigar at the same time? You have to lift it. <laughs> oh, okay. So you weren't looking while you're smoking. But does that work? No. That's not the officially yeah. licensed correct serial number of eye protection, sir. You're you're not listening to the authorities. No, no I've had, I've got a real heavy lens on mine. It's it's great. It it worked out real great. Yeah, well I'm sure if you're an experienced welder, we don't need to tell you anything about eye protection, right, Shu? Well, I can still learn. All right. Well, thank you very much, Shu, up in Farmer's Branch. Welding helmet and a cigar for his Eclipse experience. So I don't know how long you people can keep denying climate change. Yeah, I don't really mean that, but uh, they're not so sure on The View. No, look, it's it's one, one lady on The View, Sonny Hostin. She was connecting the earthquake and the eclipse and, you know, it looks like climate change to me. To their credit, Whoopi Goldberg and Joy Behar, not exactly... Pat Buchanan style right wing activists they uh, they tap the brakes on that real quick but it, it was a, it was a brilliant discussion here just just keep this in mind when Sonny Hostin talks about other issues. Uh, So what's kind of crazy is with the earthquake on Friday and then the eclipse today, people are having all sorts of conspiracies about the end of the world. And then I read online that the earthquake epicenter was actually at Bedminster in New Jersey. Right. Fun fact. So it originated with Trump. I have to. I I know, right? I mean, I have to say, um, Karen Dupich, our our wonderful, one of our wonderful makeup artists, when the earthquake was happening, she put her coat on and she was like, "Jesus is coming. I'm out. I'm, I'm out. I'm leaving. We've got a solar eclipse." Uh, we've she got the earthquake. Down the she ran down the hallway. The rapture then, is here. The rapture's here. And then all 
also I learned that the cicadas are coming. Cicadas. Cicadas. Although I love for the, the first time in cicada, cicada. like no 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 two different no two no, well they, this is what I read two, two different there's times two different kinds of cicadas yes, two different coming. times times are coming the good cicadas but, right, and the bad cicadas. but for the first time in in many many years no and seven so, every seventeen years this happens well that's not what I read but maybe <laughs> but, you know maybe well, you know better I, but in I a way say all those all those things together. What maybe lead one to believe that you know either climate change exists That's more or something point. is really or going going on. returning? That's quite so not at the mercy of climate change. It's underground. No. It can't. I don't it, think it, that's it happens. And the, and the, the eclipse. They've known about the eclipse coming because eclipses happen, and they actually can say when these things are going to happen. So all these folks who are saying, you know, it's a sign from God. God doesn't give you warning. <laughs> okay? You think he gave people at the Tower Babel warning? Oh, I'm about to jack y'all up. So let's talk about whether or not... Uh, look, we don't, we don't have to go deep into this, but whether or not earthquakes and eclipses are climate change related. Look, because Sonny Hostin threw it out there. And, I mean, eclipses happen because the sun gets blocked by the moon and there's a shadow, like a, just a little streak of a shadow for a little bit on surface of the earth how how could that even be climate change related at all like at all how could the composition of the earth's atmosphere have any effect on when the sun and the moon line up with the, i don't i don't know I, I don't know i think they've just been trained for all of these sort of meteorological climatological geological events just hey we can just associate everything with climate change and i don't blame her for doing it there was a report I thought about starting uh, the show with it on Friday. Uh, a report came out that's like each pair of blue jeans you wear adds like 5.6 tons of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. So blue jeans are killing the planet. You know, these are these are very just stretching the tangent as far as you can go. There's no connection between your choice of pantalones and the climate. There's just none. It's not a thing. Doesn't matter. What would you rather me do? Just run around in, in a loincloth? You want me to run around in my jockeys? Is is there some other fabric that has a net zero carbon emission? Of course not. But what they're secretly telling you when they do things like that, what they're secretly telling you, you know, if you, we can link the production of of not just cars or not just straws or not just your toilet, but now we're down to your jeans. Your pants are now con- connected to climate change. They are accidentally telling you all the powers that they would seize if they were able to control emissions in this country. They would have a labor of power over not just your cars or your power plants or your thermostat. Oh, no, it will be all the way down to your genes. The ability to con- control the production slash emission of carbon dioxide means you have you are almost God. You are a totalitarian level of control. So Sonny Hostin, ridiculous that she said it, of course. Obviously, she doesn't know what she's talking about. She read some things five minutes before she goes on the air, and she tries to regurgitate them as her own ideas, so she sounds intelligent in front of a multi-million audience, which isn't too far from what I do, just a much smaller audience. But you could tell, like, when, when she pr- mispronounces cicada, that tells you two things. Number one, I usually don't get upset or think lowly of people if they mispronounce words. That means they probably learn these words from reading and reading only which is fine, but it also means she doesn't know what she's talking about. If she's never heard the word cicada in her life, maybe you should sit this one out. Maybe you're not the expert. Maybe if you can't pronounce it correctly, but look, lower your expectation bar for the view. I know it's already pretty low, but you also have to think that there's millions of people out there who watch this and think these people are intelligent and they know what they're talking about or, hey, there's some worth listening to. It's been amazing. Some of the things that we have seen come out of that show. This is the same show where previous hosts, who I think Sonny Hostin is sitting in her seat, Sherry Shepard, she wasn't sure if the world was flat. Is the world flat? Is the world flat? <laughs> yes. I don't know. What do you think? I, I never thought about it, Whoopi. Is the world flat? I never thought about it. You I, never I, thought about whether never, the world was no, flat? No, but I'll tell you what I've thought about, how I'm going to feed my child well, you i'm going to take both. care of my family the world is the world flat has never entered into uh-huh. like, it, that has not been an well, important teach, thing to me. you'll teach your son jeffrey if my right? son jeffrey asked me is the world flat i guess i will go you know, and, didn't and my already work. wasn't sure i don't know if she ever got to the bottom of that mystery i haven't kept up 
But I do know what happened to her since then. She got her own show. She's just dumbed herself in, into greater levels of success. And I know some of you, you you may not, but some people out there have just a knee-jerk reaction. Why are you playing anything from The View? Why are you listening to them? Listen, even if you don't agree with it or it's not your cup of tea, it is the highest rated daytime talk show in television. Millions of people are influenced by this. Uh, when you when you see people go to the ballot box and you're like, well, how can people vote for this? Or how come women and men are so far apart in their voting patterns? Or how come you see the the, the the people in the country think this way? You have to address some of this. You have to. It's not your cup of tea, but you can't ignore it. You want to know why your sister-in-law talks like that? You want to know why your uh, retired mother-in-law, where she comes up with some of these crazy ideas? Yeah, I'm just. I'm not saying it's definitely the view's fault, but you can you can put that into the the usual suspects lineup of places where look if these people are coming back with crazy terrible ideas when on whether or not the world is flat or whether or not the eclipse is influenced by climate change. This explains how they can come to terrible conclusions on so many other issues.